My guest today is Chris Robson. Chris is the CEO of Wyvern, an Edmonton-based space company which makes satellites for agriculture imaging. Chris was also one of the major contributors to getting Alberta's first satellite launched into orbit. Chris is here to talk all things regarding the opportunities in the space industry and what the industry and agencies are currently trying to accomplish. I hope you guys enjoy. Awesome. Well, uh, thanks for making the time. Obviously, I know you're you're super busy uh, getting into that accelerator here um, not too long ago, which is exciting for you guys at Wyvern. Um, I think I wanted to start with kind of how you got involved in kind of aerospace. I feel like a lot of people, specifically with STEM backgrounds, are really, really curious about how you kind of get a foot in the door. And um, I'm kind of curious about, like, how did you get into aerospace? What was your kind of journey like to start? that got you where you are today? Oh, man. <clears throat> so I was working for an oil and gas company, and I was on one of my 15-minute my breaks, and I was it, it was 2011. It was the last launch of the space shuttle. But I'd never seen a space shuttle launch before, so or any sort of rocket launch before, for that matter. So what I did is I, I saw a news... I saw one of those little news clips on my Facebook feed and I said, you know what, I got 50 minutes, I've got nothing better to do. I'm gonna watch, you know, the last space shuttle launch. So I did. And um while I was watching it, I think I realized something really important, which was that um, you know, I, I didn't want to do oil and gas. I wanted to do space. And when I saw it, uh it was it was a little I shouldn't say a little, it was quite it was quite revolutionary in my life because at that point, like I, when I, when I knew I wanted to do space, like I really knew at that point, like it was, it was like everything lit on fire all at once anyway. So, but of course that, that brought up the problem of how do you, how do you get started with space in, in Alberta, which as you know, is mostly oil and gas and cows. So uh, as, as it turned out, there was actually a space company in Alberta at the time, but um, my, uh, it, it wasn't well advertised. But, but anyway, my, my, my journey really started in looking for an opportunity. And so the first place I started looking was actually on the University of Alberta uh, campus. And I sort of started looking in the news. And so I did find something at the U of A, uh, and it took me some time to finally get in touch with somebody and, and have a meeting. It was a group called Alberta Sat One. And there, there was maybe three or four people, uh, including my, uh, well, not including myself, I guess, but at the time who were part of the group or left in the group. Uh, they, they were all, and, all, and they were all graduating. So I, I sat down with the, with the project manager at the time. And he said, look, you know, we're all leaving. You know, we need somebody to carry on the group. Um, uh, and I think I must have been with two other people. And he said, <clears throat> and, and I said, well, I'm interested. And he said, all right, well, we need a project manager. I said, oh, I could do that, um, which was maybe a bit too uh, rambunctious of myself, but I didn't really know what I was getting into. Eh, it worked out well. So I, I, anyway, that's how I got in, is that I joined this group called Alberta Sat One, which, and, and the group was, was originally created to build Cube satellites as part of the Canadian CubeSat Challenge. So I did that, and we started growing the group um, and and one of the, the things that I did right off the bat is or right off the bat is I said okay well you know what as a group our mission is this our mission is to build a space industry in Alberta we're going to do that by launching the province's first satellite we're going to make this into a program uh, so that more satellites can be launched and then you know after we launch the first satellite we're going to you know we want to spin out of this as a as a startup and in my mind the, the thing I was thinking about was okay well. I, I want to live in Alberta, but I also want to work in space. And there's no space in Alberta, so I've got to create space in Alberta. So that's sort of the line that we went along. Uh, so we, we went out, uh, and over the course of the years, we we did end up building and launching Alberta's first satellite. And, you know, there's a lot of there was a lot of people involved in that. Uh, about two years into my term as project manager, I stepped down uh, so that I could focus on one my health and two my grades, which were really suffering because I was doing full time uh, Alberta Sat stuff. So I did that. Um, I kept working with AlbertaSat as eventually becoming the mechanical lead for the first satellite. Uh, then I went on and did a master's as mecha in mechanical engineering at the U of A. 
for uh, spacecraft dynamics. After that, what I did was I started some, sorry, not after that. During that, I started a company with some friends. Um, I ended up leaving the company just because they, they were going in a, in a different direction and, and I wanted to do something else. Uh, that was better for my career, so I decided to do that. I left, and then I ended up starting Wyvern about uh, two with with my co-founders about two two years and three months ago. Um, and anyway, the, the whole point of this is the, the the mission thus far has been build an Alberta space industry so that me, myself and other people could live and work in space in Alberta, and uh, that, that's sort of how I started off. I I said to myself that I needed to build it so that nobody else would have to. I mean, that's an amazing feat. Just going back to you are part of getting the first satellite from Alberta to be launched. I mean, what was the feeling of the yourself and the team when that finally happened, when, you know, you got that thing into orbit? I mean, it must have been huge elation um, that you guys were feeling. Like, I mean, what was that experience? Okay, so the first satellite, uh, first off, it was a 3U cube satellite. It was about this long. Uh, so that's about 30 centimeters long, about 10 centimeters wide. Anyways, we went to the launch at Cape Canaveral and we, we watched it go up on a, on a Cygnus vehicle. Uh, anyways, so w what we did with our satellite is we, we had it deployed from the International Space Station, which meant that it went up on one of the ISS cargo vehicles. It sat on the station for about a month Astronauts loaded it into a deployment canister, which they stuck out the airlock. Uh, it was grabbed by the Canada arm. Canada arm pointed it, and the CubeSats were shot out like a Pez dispenser. So we, uh, uh, anyway, so that, those are actually two separate events. When we went to watch the rocket launch, I cried like a baby. Um, I mean, it was 2000 and was it 2017? I think it was 2017. Like five, five years of your life was finally going into space. And there was a lot of moments where you were like, okay, like I'm not sure if this is actually going to, going to happen or not. Um, and then we were, when we watched it, and, and so I was there with a bunch of Alberta side folks. Um, so yeah, big, really big guy crying his, his eyes out. Then <clears throat> when we actually deployed it from the space station about a month later. We were all sitting in a room at the University of Alberta in the observatory room at around two in the morning. And it was just like, once it deployed, like we, we got to watch a video of it live. It was, take, it was a video taken by one of the astronauts there. It was, wow. it was amazing. Like it was just freaking awesome. And uh, after seeing that video, like everybody was cheering and everybody was really happy. But then the best thing is we heard it like chirp. Like it actually communicated, and uh, and then we, yeah, like it, it was it was it was elation. It was it was good. First, the first one was okay. We sent something to space. The second was, one was we sent something to space and it actually worked, which uh, were two very important criteria for me to consider it a success. And and yeah, it was it was an amazing feeling. It was an awesome feeling. That. That just sounds unbelievable. And I mean, the fact that um, you can tell that you guys, you know, you're putting so much work into obviously making that happen. And you can tell that you're, you know, you almost have to be passionate about it because it's such a big feat. There's so much hard work, so much sacrifice that goes into these things. If you're not passionate about it, if you're not someone who's, you know, going to go into tears seeing this thing go into space, then it's probably not something that you should get involved with because it, it seems like it takes so much out of you um, listening to you speak and um, from other people in the industry as well, like what people at, you know, SpaceX go through to try and do the incredible feats that they do. So it sounds like uh, you made the right decision from oil and gas to space because uh, I don't know what would happen in oil gas that would bring you to such an emotional state. <laughs> I mean, I guess getting hit by a drill pipe. I mean, that would hurt a lot. I imagine that would, that would be pretty emotional after that. Yeah. So with the actual, I know you said that the satellite, the first one that you guys sent up was quite small, um, I guess in relative to other satellites that have been launched out there. So because of that, 
do you did you not have to worry too much about how it's going to fit in the cargo space or like if it's going to jumble around like is it kind of just they give you some parameters of the size you build the satellite and then they kind of take care of it in terms of how it's going to um, perform in the payload, so to speak? Well, so whenever you send to space, you always care about how big it is, how much it weighs and, and how it fits in, in the case of the, so in the case of the, of the cargo ship. We, so first we, we had a, we had a volume that we had to build our satellite within and it had to be stowed inside of that volume in order to get to the space station and also deploy out of the space station. But somebody else took care of packing it and putting it in the cargo ship. You know, some, uh, not, you know, the, the, the people involved on the NASA side and the, and the, the provider we went with NanoRax, you know, they, they made sure that, you know, after an extensive review that we were, you know, we were good to go and that we, uh, you know, we, we had everything taken care of. And, and right before we actually sent it out, or sorry, before it actually went out to to uh, the launch facility, you know, you know, our, our project manager and our systems en engineer at the time actually flew out with the satellite to the location where it was being packaged, and you know, they made they made sure that any like they, they did any final checks on the satellite. They they prepared the satellite to be stowed inside of this box for months on end before being packed into the rock, being shipped and packed into the rocket. Uh, anyway, the point is, is that it's it's not it's not quite like sending something via UPS to somebody else. It's the packing and the making sure everything is packed properly and that it's it's going to work when you unpack it in space is, is quite an ordeal. Yeah, I think um, for those of us that watch the most recent SpaceX launches, you get to see just how big of a checklist and parameters they look at before uh, they do one of these launches, especially when, you know, launching human beings uh, in, you know, the Dragon capsule. It's, it's a big ordeal. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely too. That's definitely true. You know, those uh, rockets don't have the best, uh, the rockets don't have the best success slash failure uh, rates. You know, they, uh, Oh, it's been some time since I've checked maybe a couple of years now, but when I did check, it was about 90% success rate for launching a rocket. Um, when it comes to launching a human on top of a rocket, they, they take as much care as they possibly can to, to make sure it's good. Yeah, absolutely. So now that you've kind of moved on and you're now at Wyvern, um, leading that kind of um, new initiative, this new startup of yours, is that what was the kind of thought process behind starting this in terms of what it provides? Maybe you could talk a little bit about, you know, what it is Wyvern, why does it exist? And how does that play into creating this future of space in Alberta that you've kind of embarked on? Sure thing. So Wyvern is a satellite data company that's providing high resolution, hyperspectral data from our satellites that's better than today's satellite imagery and it's better priced. And the thing that led to it was actually a conversation. Um, well, it was actually a conversation with one of my co-founders, Kristen Cote, when we were we were uh, meeting up during one of the oh the second Canadian uh, Small Sat Symposium, um, and unfortunately the last one too. But anyways, uh, you know we we were we were talking about. Uh, you know, we were talking about the future. We were talking about space uh, because we're both space geeks. We actually met uh, when we launched a rocket together in Norway. But anyways, we were, you know, I, I, so I had just left a, I had just left a company. And uh, while I was there, I ran it, I, I came across something called hyperspectral imaging, which was, which was something that was, you know, uh, it's been, it's been researched the heck out of since, Oh, the, I think the seventies or the eighties. Anyways, mostly from aircraft, a few times from space too, but there has always been a huge barrier of getting hyperspectral from space. That's been that you need to have a huge satellite. Um, anyway, so I, I ran into hyperspectral when I was working for the previous company, but uh, you know, it was, it's, it was nothing we ever did anything with and we moved on. Um, and one of the big reasons is because of cost uh, of, of actually putting up a satellite. So, um, Kristen, uh, like during this, during this meeting, you know, one of the things she said to me is, Hey, you know, there's this technology I've been working on 
uh, or sorry, uh, working on, but also that, that I propose to have researched that uh, I think, like, and it could do this, this, and this. I made the, uh, the connection with hyperspectral. Uh, we both said, hey, you know, this would be a great, like this would allow us to produce high resolution hyperspectral um, and use it on a satellite platform that costs up to 100 times less than what you would need. Um, anyways, so we put those two, two things together and Wyvern was born. Now, part of the reason behind that is because hyperspectral has huge potential for pretty much any industry or pra any industry, any civil application, or any def military application that involves remote assets or, or operations over large land areas, uh, which covers a lot of human activity. You know, for example, in, in the, you know, in the, on the energy side, you might monitor the uh, the ability is the performance of an older well site that has been environmentally remediated. You know, you, you want to know how well that remediation has gone. Hyperspectral data will tell you. Where you need to determine something that you would otherwise need to send somebody into the field with a, speci a special piece of equipment or a special camera, you could figure that out with hyperspectral data from space. Uh, for example, identifying uh, what what kind of mineral composition you see on the surface of the Earth, which is really important when you're you know prospecting for new minerals. Uh, it's really important in things like agriculture, being able to determine the nitrogen concentration of, of various uh, parts of your field for different crops, uh, crop vegetation health and analysis, uh, biomass estimation, lo lots of really great stuff. It's it's an excellent tool for the people that do what they need to do with these remote assets and these, these large areas of land um, that allows them to get more information, better insight that ultimately leads to better profitability or better social or environmental impact on whatever it is they're managing. So, uh, you know, in, in our minds, <clears throat> the ability to go out and build a satellite constellation that is able to accurately, to, to paint an accurate chemical picture of what's going on Earth you know, that, that's our way of, of providing a tool to fight climate change. That's our way of, of, of providing a tool that helps humans and the rest of Earth live in a symbiotic relationship um, and in a way that's not damaging. It's so difficult to measure our own impact, the, the negative impact on our environment at a fine scale in, um, in a short period of time. It's much easier to see the impact at a large scale over a long period of time, and that's a problem because the world doesn't work on on the the, the, the impact. So the environmental the environment of Earth does not react quickly; it reacts slowly. Some of the changes that have been made over the, like that's that's the thing with CO two, right? Even with the current concentration, we're not going to see the major impacts until later. It's just the way it works, and it sucks. But hyperspectral data can give insight on a global scale into how our earth is changing, how we're affecting that earth. It can provide data at a very, very high fidelity. Um, it can also be, it can also provide a lot of data that would increase the, you know, the potential economic outcome that different countries and, and societies around the globe could reap from their current operations while at the same time minimizing their environmental impact. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I actually recently came across hyperspectral imaging in research for my own venture recently um, that maybe I'll have to um, inform you on after this episode, but it's, uh, it's very, very interesting stuff. I mean, I was looking at it um, from the angle of early crop disease detection, um, looking how they use it in plant phenotyping. Um, so it's really cool. And how I think about it from, you kind of mentioned the data aspect, having all this data where we can use and, react um if you are able to have enough data on you know a plant soil system and <clears throat> you can see i mean i'm not too deep into hyperspectral imaging and its application yet so some of this might be naive thinking um early on but if you're able to see and know and react how all the little components of a plant soil system work and then apply something like game theory, which is the subset of kind of AI to it, then potentially you could treat all those little, you know, microbes and cells and whatnot as an intelligent agent. And then with game theory, you could eventually maybe simulate a plant soil 
ecosystem, which is really interesting to me. Um, but yeah, hyperspectral is like very, very cool. Um, you know, using other imaging wavelengths to detect uh, funguses and whatnot in crops. So it was so funny that uh, you were coming on and I stumbled upon this kind of idea and it just like perfectly coincided with kind of the technology you guys are doing. I mean, you guys are doing aerial imaging with, with crops and stuff. So yeah, that's like really, really cool. I love, uh, I love how you guys are kind of taking that and putting it in a, you know, hyperspectral, being able to make things more cost effective, which is huge. Um, it seems like that's a, a big trope when it comes to the space industry, making things more cost effective. Um, you know, <clears throat> I suppose that is a trope when it comes to the space industry, making things more cost effective. It's almost a damaging one though. You know, if you're looking at competing in an industry, Competing on price, that's a zero-sum game. It's always a race to the bottom. Nobody's going to win that. The thing with the space industry is being able to provide a price competitively and, and to be able to provide a value, to be able to provide a value that is different than what you can get today at a, at a reasonable price. That, I think that's what I'm, so what I'm trying to say is that it's in the space industry right now, we are trying to lower the prices on everything. Launch is a really big one. That's why there's like 150 small sat launch providers trying to trying to compete here. Um, you know, they're they're all trying to find the best way to to give a low price. Of course, they're also saying this is where the most money is going to be made because of how many satellites are going to be launched. Um, and that the whole small sat ecosystem is a or sorry, the whole small sat launch provider ecosystem is a different conversation than this one that I can probably rant about for a little bit. But anyways, the point is, is that um, the ones that are really unique, the ones that uh, the ones that uh, are going to compete well, are all going to be providing some sort of value or doing something a little bit differently, while also be having a competitive price point. You know, for example, some uh, small sat provi uh, providers, um, you know, they're gonna they're gonna run into an issue of trying to compete with SpaceX. SpaceX is doing something like five thousand dollars per kilogram right now. Like that's unprecedented in the history of, in the history of paying for something to go to space. That's a ridiculously low price. And a lot of small sack uh, providers are going to have a hell of a time competing with it. But you know what, when it comes to launching a constellation, they might have an advantage because if they have a primary payload, that's a constellation as opposed to SpaceX, which you pay that for a ride share, then you might be able to get a satellite to go to a very specific orbit. And uh, you know what? Going to that orbit is important, especially for a constellation. And spacing the constellation out is also important. That's something that you can be competitive on. Another thing could just be the way that you get there, or how you reduce, or how you uh, produce the product that you know you're pricing for. If you could, if you could uh, charge five thousand dollars for per kilogram like SpaceX does, but do it for, but produce that, you know that uh, that kilogram in orbit for 10 times less than SpaceX has to pay, then that's, that's also a competitive solution. Um, anyway, the point I'm trying to make is that, yeah, we're, we're trying to, we're trying to lower prices or costs across the board, which, um, isn't a good way to go. Uh, we do need a lower cost in order to create a competitive industry, but we don't just need a lower cost. We also need to provide something that's valuable. That's been the biggest problem with space. Actually, that's probably been one of the biggest issues with, uh, you know, with remote sensing, there are other remote sensing companies out there and every single one of them is trying to provide higher resolution imagery at a lower cost. Um, but there, but, we're, but all these remote sensing companies are trying to do the same thing. Um, as they're trying to do business as usual, high amounts of volume, uh, higher spatial resolution, not a lot of extra spectral stuff, not a lot, you know, lower, they're, they're trying to lower their prices across the board. Um, I don't know, the point is, is that it's a dangerous, it, it's a dangerous uh, frame of mind that we've gotten into in the space industry. Yeah, it sounds like the driving force for innovation to just make things cheaper, you're saying is probably not the way to go and that there's probably better driving forces to innovate and uh, kind of expand and further this industry. 
Well, right. I mean, when uh, when they invented uh, when when the car was invented, you know, it wasn't to the, the driving innovation there wasn't to to make you know horses cheaper or or getting to the grocery store cheaper. There was a lot of there was a lot of value that a car added that you know you didn't have to feed your car. Your car didn't literally die. It, it, your car couldn't get sick. There, there's tons of things like that. A lot of the innovative things are like that too. You know, look at an iPhone. An iPhone was not less expensive than a Motorola. Uh, what what you remember those little Motorola phones back in the early aughts? Oh yeah, absolutely. It had Snake on it, and I think it had a really crappy version of Solitaire. I can't remember. I only ever played Snake on it. But the point is, is that like those things were definitely definitely less expensive than an iPhone, but the value that an iPhone provided was was huge. I could listen to all the music I wanted on it, browse on the internet. I could store, like, a, the, the interface was so much better. There weren't a ton of buttons, which is great, because I don't know if you've seen my fingers, but they're like friggin' sausages. Um, anyway, that was, and it's not like, other, it's not like people at the time weren't working on different phones. It's just, if you can, if you try to compete on price, that you're going to lose. Yeah, I'm wondering, um, you know, off the top of your head, do you think there's, what are some other things that this, it, the space industry should be focusing on as a driving force for innovation other than price? Is there anything that comes to mind? Uh, well, I mean, definitely providing some sort of added value um, to like the, the people on earth. A great example is probably satellite internet. I don't know if you've used if you used satellite internet before, like these internet constellations came along, but it was really it's, it's, it is really slow. But I, so my parents lived in the in the countryside, and um, we had to either pay for satellite internet or we had to get our internet from one of the the local remote internet suppliers. The fastest one was maybe ten megabits per second down, and that, and that was shared with a bunch of other acreages in the area. The the value like a and the thing is, is that it was like a hundred bucks a month, like wow, two hundred dollars a month just to get that ten megabits per second, constant ten megabits per second, and only for me. I totally would have done that. That's that's what I mean about providing the value. But like, if somebody tried to put up internet that was you know five, you know the same thing, like ten megabits per second shared at like ten dollars, still wouldn't have paid for it you're still sharing it like what and what can you do with shared 10 megabits per second seriously i ran some of the numbers on our downlink speed once it was like one one and a half megabits per second like, what are you gonna do like are you, are you gonna visit the websites that are still like kicking around from the 90s like shit, that is a slow internet speed so you, you have something like satellite internet and all of a sudden you know places all over canada the farmers uh, people that live in acreages, people in remote communities now have access to high-speed internet that you don't have to lay optical cable for. Like that's that's something that's value added, and that's not necess- that that's you're not compete- You don't have to compete on price for. You're adding a value that people will happily play- pay for because it solves a ton of their other problems, or at, at the very least, it serves a need that they have, which in this case is access to the internet. Um, another great example would be, oh. Uh, so in the, uh, sorry, there's, there's a few running through my head, but I'm trying to, I'm, I'm trying to pick a good one. Um, okay. Consider aircraft. So, uh, have you ever wondered why some of those air, air aircraft, like the Malaysian aircraft airline uh, went missing and we couldn't find it? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, you know, if, if uh, it's, it's kind of wild how many things that we don't actually track in real time. Like my, my cell phone is telling Google where I am 24 seven. Probably. I don't know. I, I don't really care. Google can come find me, but that, that's not the point. The point is though, is that how, how do you lose an airplane in today's age? Well, one, one of the ways that you can solve this is by having a constellation that, uh, you know, a constellation of cube satellites that does ADSB, um, which allow, which basically it's a, it's a system where a, a little radio on the air, airplane constantly tweets out 
where its location is. And the satellite constellation picks it up. Problem is, is if you're in the middle of, let's say, the Pacific Ocean, and there's no satellites, there's, there's also no radio stations for you to pick it up. So you are actually in the middle of nowhere, and nobody can tell you where you are. And you can't transmit over a GPS constellation, because that's not how GPS works, works, right? GPS, the satellites are sending their location, and your GPS receiver is calculating its position based off of the based off of a bunch of, of satellites telling telling that uh, that receiver where where they are. But you can't send that data back, so you can lose it. So you could lose an airplane, which is a problem, because what if you lose an airplane and you have like and, and you know you're in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, you have a hundred people who are still alive but won't be for much longer because airplanes are made of metal, they will sink. And you know that there's only so long you can survive in the Pacific Ocean without food. And honestly, it's really hard to find people or find anything in, in, a, in a one square kilometer area, much less than something the size of the Pacific Ocean. That's not an easy thing to do. Um, so these, this is another great example of the valuable applications of space. Uh, being able to manufacture things in space for space applications. That's another one. One that I, I don't think will be realized for a while. But you can imagine that the only thing that is really important for us to get off of Earth is humans. Any other material we could theoretically find in space. So if you could find it, mine it, and then make it in space, you would reduce the amount of fuel you need to get people into orbit or increase the amount of people you could get get into orbit with every rocket launch, which would be valuable because we would be spending less fuel, which means less CO2 emissions, that kind of thing. You know, there's a lot of great, other great applications. Remote sensing is a really big one as well. I know all the use cases for that one, which is why I also haven't spoken about that one because it would be uh, almost a shameless plug, maybe. But, um, you know, maybe, uh, maybe a good example is that uh, Oh gosh, what is a really good example for this one? Let's go with the South African example. Okay, so in South Africa, there is a law that allows you to put up a roof on a piece of land and you have 48 hours before you get expelled from that piece of land, uh, to get expelled from that piece of land before you legally are allowed to live there. So, you can imagine that if you've got a, a highway or a pipeline or, or you know, a, a power line, somebody goes onto that, that land, erects, erects a, a dwelling, and they suddenly have the legal right to live there. What, what, what are you going to do if you were about to build something on that land? Or right. if they tell you that you're not allowed to have your, their pipeline on, on their land? Well, that, that's a big problem. People need to, so they, they monitor, they actually fly airplanes for this reason, or they, they try to keep an eye on the site. That's something that you can do from space. An, another great example is being able to identify where the, well, actually you brought it up earlier, where diseases are in a crop, and specifically being able to identify them early. The, either identify the, the, that the crop has a disease or that the conditions for a certain disease are present um, and the risk factor is increased and so the farmer should go out and do that. That's also a big deal because you can imagine if you have four square kilometers of, of farmland, which is about the average for Canada, that it's really hard keeping an eye on every single part of that land over the, like every single day. And the, and the reality is, is that your crop is changing every day. Um, there's, there's a lot of really great applications for space. There's a lot of really great commercial applications for space. Um, anyway, so in terms of driving innovation, it should be, look, it should be looked at as what is, the, what is the value to either the consumer, because that's, that's one of the things that makes Elon Musk so successful. He's got this mission of getting humanity off the planet, but he said to himself, I'm gonna figure out how to finance this myself um, by doing something commercial, which drove you know, the, which is driving his ability to do this. Um, or it's, what is this going to do for the public good? You know, th those are two very powerful drivers. That's what space needs to focus on. We talk a lot about, in the space industry, about exploration and about the new frontier and about uh, the unlocking the secrets, the secrets of the universe. But let's be honest, that is not going to incentivize 
uh, that, that, that's really hard to incentivize because the vast majority of us aren't focused on that. The vast majority of us are focused on our everyday lives and what the, like what, what things can be done for us. You know, another great example is actually GPS, uh, specifically a GPS constellation that's more accurate than the one that's up there right now. If you could have something that was that was more accurate, you could have self-driving cars that drove only on, you know, precision GPS. And, and you can imagine how tough that would be right now, given that sometimes your phone's GPS thinks you're in Walmart, you know? <laughs> yeah, 100%. It's, um, it's funny that, um, I mean, thinking about, the whole, the constellations and the, I, I kind of actually want to go back to the internet satellite um, systems. And it seems that that's something Elon Musk and SpaceX is trying to address with Starlink, if I'm not mistaken. Um, what ex is, are they just basically these new satellites are just a way faster, robust system version of the satellite internet? Is that exactly what the value add for that and the purpose? Because I think they've, some people have said, you know, they're talking about global free Wi-Fi and stuff like that. I'm not 100% sure exactly what the value proposition for the Starlink initiative is. Uh, well, you can think about, about it as putting either a, a cell phone tower or a, a, a very powerful router in orbit and putting a lot of them there. It, it basically would allow you to have internet access, um, high-speed internet access specifically almost anywhere. It's probably and it's probably not something that a lot of people think about uh, because a lot of us do live in cities or in regions that have high speed internet access. Um, but the fact is, is that there are there's a lot of there there are plenty of places in the world that don't have that, especially for um, you know we're used to cell phone access, but a lot of places in the world don't necessarily have access to a high speed internet internet connection for their home. Like for example. I was talking earlier about my parents that live in, live in live on an acreage. You know, right now what we got set up for them is we basically took a SIM card and put it in a, it's called a hotspot. Uh, basically, it's basically a cell phone that has an ethernet port on it. And we paid for a, a you know, a data plan for them to, in order for them to have, have internet because we can't rely on the rural internet services in the area. But the fact is, is that it's still expensive and they still are limited to 100 gigabytes per month or they have to start paying like $10 a gigabyte every time they go over that. Anyway, so the value proposition there is that you can, you know, you can extend these high speed services out to rural areas or to remote communities. And you either, to do that, to do that now, you either have to set up a cell phone tower with, with uh, you know, with, with some pretty high throughput antennas on them where you have to lay cable you have to lay fiber optic cable which is also incredibly expensive yeah absolutely it seems like um you're right uh people who live in urban centers forget that there's parts of even within a first world country like canada that don't have access to you know the quality of internet that we do in these centers so there's a ton of opportunity and a ton of use cases and people that could benefit from something like starlink um, I, uh, I wanted to touch on one more thing that you got me thinking about when talking about um, kind of the alternative uh, tracking method in terms of GPS. So GPS is um, the satellites are telling, telling kind of the system where they are in relation to the device, correct? That's what it was. But we want to do the other way around where the plane in your example is telling the system where it is so we can track all those things. So I'm, was that, is that kind of, is that accurate? So, sort of. So in the case of the GPS constellation, you know where you are because the satellites are telling you, um, are, are able to tell you where you are, but you can't tell the GPS satellite where you are. So right. The GPS satellite is just constantly transmitting out a signal. And that signal contains a packet of information that tells whatever received it, the location and the, the precise uh, position of, of that GPS satellite. And when you get the precise posi uh, positions of at least three GPS satellites, you can triangulate uh, your location on Earth to a certain degree of precision. For something like an airplane, uh, you would use a different satellite constellation, but you would use a technology called ADS-B, where you are essentially communicating your position to that, to that uh, satellite constellation. 
essentially you you got a repeating beacon on your aircraft that tells other people where you are. Right. So the kind of train of thought I was having is, is there going to be barriers to putting up things like this? Because it seems there's some rifts in the international community lately, especially with China and the other international community. I think I heard that they're looking to build their own ISS and whatnot. And, you know, countries are going to want to control and track and control of the data to be able to track certain things. And I could just see maybe there could be issues with, you know, trying to tap into each other's networks and track their air traffic and stuff. Do you, do you see there being, I guess what I'm trying to ask is, do you see there being hurdles with advancing space now that the kind of geopolitical arena is getting very heated and there's a lot of issues popping up, um, especially between superpowers? Yes, very much so. So, uh, you know, the thing that uh, I, I don't know if, if people think about often, well, I mean, they, they, they don't think about this specifically, but space is the ultimate high ground. Um, we worry about, about nuclearization and, and uh, you know, the new, a new Cold War starting, about other countries having nuclear weapons. But if you have weapons in outer space, you can literally strike anywhere in the world within 90 minutes or 100 minutes. Um, I mean, give or take. That's, that's about how long it takes for our satellite to orbit the Earth once. The, the, the point is, though, is that it's the ultimate high ground. You, if, you have, if you've weaponized space before anybody else has, you have an incredible advantage as a country. That's one of the reasons why, weapon, uh, why putting weapons of mass destruction in space has been illegal internationally. Um, Anyway, the point, I'm, the point is, though, that I think, I think the geopolitical situation is going to make space expansion difficult. It's going to make it difficult because I think that, uh, you know, each of these superpowers is going to want to weaponize space. You know, I mean, you can almost sort of see that happening with the Space Force. Um, and I, I'm, you know, I'm certain, that, I, I'm, cer I'm certain that this is probably going to happen with China as well or with, with Russia or with the United States. Uh, and there's also going to be massive opportunities to claim vast resources in space that can greatly, greatly impact any of these, any of these superpowers' economic growth as a country. And you could imagine how, uh, you could imagine how much conflict that could breed especially when you look at some of the smaller conflicts we see planet side, like everything going on in the South China Sea, um, or anything that involves international, anything that involves deep water mining, or any time you see in, in the Canadian North, you see another country trying to, you know, uh, claim the squatters rights, one of the islands up there. Now imagine that with a, with an asteroid that has enough, has three times the platinum that earth has. I mean, supply and demand wise, that asteroid bob probably wouldn't be worth that much, but I mean, only if you brought it all down at once. But, but if you had a steady state of that, it'd be like having, it's like the oil sands, right? Uh, the oil sands back in, you know, the early 2000s, right? You know, we had vast reserves of this very, very valuable substance. We had a lot, of, as a result, we, like Alberta had some geopolitical power. Um, that, yeah, anyway. I do believe very strongly that the geopolitical situation is going to impact space expansion. And I don't know where it's going to go. Yeah. It seems like it's uh, it's another realm in and of itself and it touches every other industry, specifically space and space seems to be one of those industries that relies heavily on the cooperation and, you know, everyone getting along in that arena. Um, so it's uh it's something I guess that as someone in the space industry, I'd imagine you'd have to play, pay close attention to, I would guess. It definitely is. It definitely is something you have to pay close attention to. Um, you know, uh, you're right. So I, the space industry is global. We have suppliers and customers and partners in all parts of the globe. 
but we do have to be careful about who we work with because that could impact who we sell to or who we're allowed to fly with or so on and so forth. Uh, you know, a, a great example is that it would be like if you were a U.S. space company, it would be really, it would be impossible for you to work with a Chinese space company. Um, fr frankly, it's really, t it's really, it can be really tough for a U.S. space company to work with any other com uh, company because they have pretty tight um, regulations around spacecraft technology. It, it doesn't prevent them though. I mean, it, they are still, the, well, you know, one of the, the primary drivers of space technology in the world. But that's, and it's not just China and other countries though. It's, yeah. Um, yeah, that's, it's, uh, it's definitely a, a situation that has to be monitored as we go through. And, you know, hopefully, you know, we say, oh, you know, um, we make generalizations and we just say Russia's doing this, China is doing this, but it is the governments, you know, there are companies within these, um, countries that want to collaborate and want to, you know, further the industry, um, outside of kind of the, um, the playbook or the motivations of the, of the government, which is, I think, encouraging and motivating because it's not everyone over there is hell bent on creating their own thing. I mean, there's lots of people and companies over there. I'm sure, like you said, want to collaborate. It's just sometimes the regulations can kind of block that sharing of information, which is detrimental to science as a whole, as we all know. Right. Um, but yeah, so we're getting close to our, End time here. I know you wanted to cut it at one because I'm sure you're a busy guy. Um, I wanted to close out with, is there anything that you see coming in the space industry in the next five to 10 years that you're personally really excited about um, that some people might not know of? Oh boy, that's a good question. Um, I'm really excited to see in orbit maintenance and service become a thing. So right now you can imagine how difficult it is to repair anything in space. Uh, in case in point, Hubble spacecraft, they had to send an astronaut to repair it. That whole mission almost cost, cost as much as sending the Hubble up in the first place. But, uh, you know, the one thing that people might not realize, or at least they might not think about it, the first thing when it comes to spacecraft is that uh, we get one shot to put it up and do it successfully. That's, that's one of the reasons why it's so tough. That's one of the reasons why it's, it's been economically very difficult to do. It's because you put something up, it's got to be, it's got to work. Now, smaller satellites allow you to get around this problem by, you know, by uh, basically by, by having a, a system that is reliable often enough that the majority of what you put up is going to work and will you know provide the windfall you need to keep on going plus cover any losses that you have but if you were able to repair it you could change you could change a lot of the the current space paradigm you know you could start looking at standardized components you could start looking at replaceable components you can start repurposing or upgrading old space vehicles with newer technology and, you know, there's some things that are really expensive, but that just, you know, they, they, there's not really a lot you can, you, you could have done to repair it anyway, for example, or sorry, there's not really a lot of, a lot that you could have done to, to make it better anyway. So it's still valuable. You know, a great example being a really big structure in space. You might want to upgrade the electronics or what if you have a, you know, a 10 foot antenna in space, which would be really, really big. Anyway, um, you could repurpose that with a new type of transmitter. A lot of good stuff there. But the thing is though, is that it, when you start making way for things like repair, replaceable parts and in-orbit maintenance, then you start making the way for in-orbit construction and for people to live and work in orbit and for things like you know, fueling depots and stuff like that. And, and that is a catalyst for the rest of, for, for industry. That's that's where going and working in space is going to become ubiquitous in our lives. That uh, yeah, hundred percent. That sounds super exciting. Um, thank you everyone for tuning in and listening. I had an awesome time talking to you, Chris. I'm a big time fan of the space industry and space geek, so it's 
always fun to talk to someone who actually knows what's going on. And um, thank you for making the time. I know you're, you're super busy right now. So this was awesome. I'd love to have you on again when, uh, whenever we see a couple new launches go or we put another person on the moon. It'd be nice to kind of hear your two cents on everything that's going on. Awesome. Hey, thanks a lot, Brennan. And uh, you have a good one. And thanks for inviting me here. Yeah, no problem, man.